happening and welcome to the Dr. Creepy segment. With the ongoing controversial topic of the UFO phenomenon, as a whole, there's one element in the world of UFOs that is a little hard to digest, and that is alien abductions. Alien abductions have made headlines around the world, with one of the earliest publicized accounts that being of Betty and Barney Hill. Furthermore, it would be the interest of John Mack, a Harvard psychiatrist who became more interested in the whole alien abduction phenomenon and bring people's encounters to the general public and the scientific community. But for one case that is still shrouded in mystery, that being of Linda Cortal Napolitano. Tonight, we take a look at the Brooklyn Bridge UFO abduction. The case is over 23 documented eyewitness and may have involved a world political leader. Before we get into it, be sure to subscribe and leave a comment about what next case you would like us to cover next. It's a small click for you, but for us, it really means a lot. The, the Brooklyn Bridge UFO abduction of Linda Napolitano is one of the most witnessed abductions in recent times. Who is Linda? So now let's get into it. Linda Napolitano is your average Catholic going mother in the late 1980s. She resided on the Lower East Side of Manhattan in New York City with her husband Steve and two sons during a chilly late evening. Linda had just gone to bed after some late night chores. On November 30th, 1989, Linda and her husband were asleep in their 12th story apartment. Linda states she was the last one that went to bed that night. Linda, she was in the middle of saying her prayers when she suddenly saw a creature standing at the foot of her bed. I, I went into bed, I said my presence. I was about to be abducted. She describes the creature as humanoid, gray in color and approximately three feet tall, throwing a pillow and starting to physically try to attack this gray creature in her room. She then becomes completely paralyzed to the point where she can't do anything then. All of a sudden, a bright blue beam starts shining through her bedroom window. In this rare 2014 interview, Linda goes in depth with radio host Dr. J. And I saw this, this creature standing at the foot of the bed. By now, my knees are numb. And um, then it, it got on top of the bed and it crouched down looked me straight in the eyes and hissed. They hissed. It was great. Before I knew it, the rest of my body was numb except my arms, so I picked up a decorated, you know, a decorative pillow and I threw it at this uh, creature. And it fell back. And then I had that afterthought, well, now it's going to get even with me and hurt my family. By that time, uh, after that, I don't know what happened. She claims her window was closed and sealed shut with metal bars, is feeling her body being lifted off of the bed by a bright blue beam of light. And then the next thing she knows, Linda is floating through her window. It's almost like magic. Force literally folds her body into a fetal position while she is completely paralyzed by this unknown force. She then realized, that she is now standing upright and floating above the city. Linda is now being pulled inside the ship with the three creatures that abducted her in a trapeze formation. The spacecraft had been outside her apartment long enough for citizens to witness her abduction. Around five in the morning. After waking up, she had just thought she had an awful nightmare, when in reality, it feels as if she had just been in a spaceship as she is waking up and attempting to recall what had just happened to her. However, the past two hours just felt really foggy. Linda had recently worked with a hypnotic therapist and would urgently reach out to Bud Hopkins. In April 1989, ufologist Bud Hopkins receives a letter from a woman named Linda Cortile. Linda writes that in 1976, she noticed a strange bump near her nose. Bud decides to follow up with Linda. He then organizes a meeting to discuss Linda's past experiences. They meet for the first time in Bud's office, where for an hour or so, she talks to him about her life and her alleged experiences. 
Linda's accounts do not immediately appear to be related to any alien abductions at that time. She then starts attending Bud's abduction support groups. Linda at first is just a passive listener, at least until something out of this world occurs, something that leads her to doubt her entire existence, which being the night of November the 30th, 1989, an event that changed her life forever. After the passing of time and some hypnotic regression with Bud, Linda recalls some information on what happened on that November 30th. During her hypnotic regression, she describes the following. She could recall the New York City skyline as she entered the alien vessel, floating in the light slowly. They all ascended into the saucer-shaped craft once inside the ship. The humanoid creatures escorted Linda down a hallway that was lined with benches. As they passed various rooms, she heard the hiss of doors sliding open and closing. The creatures were quietly talking to each other, but they were speaking a language. Linda didn't understand. They bring Linda to a bright room and in the center of the room is a long table. This sent Linda into a panic and she started screaming in her mind. She was screaming, what do you want? From me? But the words that came out of her mouth were in an alien language. One of the beings put a hand over Linda's mouth. Then she felt something in her nose. A long medical instrument was forced into her right nostril and was told to remain quiet in the alien's language. What am I going to do? He comes closer with his instrument and dirty feet. Okay, now we're going to turn that pain down very quickly. You just very quick and now it's gone. Bud Hopkins was a well-known painter in the New York City art world. He made a name for himself as a ufologist. He was a well-known for his investigations on alien abduction, and he even worked with Wetley Strieber. Bud investigated on many of cases of abduction. He wrote several books, including the bestseller Intruders and Missing Time. It all began with this photograph. After the publication of his first book on UFO research called Missing, Bud received this picture from Kathy Davis of Indianapolis. Kathy claimed that the circle and strip of dead grass had appeared in her yard after she had seen a UFO in the area, and she wondered if the damage had been caused by a UFO taking off and landing. Oddly, she also mentioned that both she and her mother had similar scars, and neither of them could remember the causes. Her curiosity opened a floodgate of revelations. Under hypnosis, Kathy recalled not just the terrifying events of the night she mentioned, which culminated with her abduction, but several other close encounters that had occurred throughout her life. Bud would hold many therapy-like sessions with witnesses, contactees, and alleged abductees. He also had a working relationship with Dr. John Mack. Linda Napolitano was working with Bud Hopkins on hypnotic regression sessions. Bud Hopkins had lived in New York City and lived close to Linda. She had written a letter to Bud stating that she had an implant in her nasal cavity during one of her abductions. The cavity was examined by a physician who insisted that she must have undergone surgery when she was younger. Linda could not recall any surgeries in her lifetime. In 1991, two years after the abduction, Linda reached out to Hopkins with an X-ray of her nose, showing a cylindrical object that Hopkins describes as having, quote, spiraling extensions that curl out away. Form her face, quote, the X-ray was taken by a surgeon and Linda's niece, Lisa Bayer, shortly after Linda claimed the object was gone. Hopkins reports that Linda visited a nose and throat specialist who confirmed the object was gone. A conspicuous ridge of built-up cartilage showed where it had once been embedded. Linda Cortila's nasal cavity, I'll show you a more of a close-up, a small object, which she recalled going in on the end of a needle. She had a scar there, and she remembered a round thing, but somehow it's as if it expanded once it was inside her nostril. And once the x-rays were taken, uh, a couple of days later, she woke up bleeding from the right nostril. There was nothing there anymore when we had a re-x-rayed and there was a little cut. Where did it go? It's as if they somehow know what happened. The case gained attention due to the fact that it involved a United Nations Secretary General at the time, Javier Perez de Cuellar, who was believed to be abducted alongside Linda. 
After the incident, the two bodyguards who were tasked with protecting Queller, Richard and Dan, were allegedly determined to find out what happened, even going so far as stalking Linda. Bud would receive large amounts of mail from various contactees due to him having an open door policy. In February 1991, he received a letter that got his attention. Bud was blown away by this discovery. Dear Mr. Hopkins, my partner and I are police officers. We have been in a serious dilemma because of our strict profession and our lack of knowledge on this subject. Morning, about 3 to 3, 30 a.m. In late November 1989, we sat in our patrol car under a strange oval hovering over the top of an apartment building, two to three blocks up from where we were sitting. Its lights turned from a bright reddish orange to a very bright whitish blue coming out from the bottom of it. It moved out away from the building and lowered itself to an apartment window just below. I, we grabbed hold of each other and were going to get out of the car. But what could we do for that poor little girl or woman wearing a full white nightgown? She was floating in midair in a bright beam of whitish blue light, looking like an angel. She was then brought up into the bottom of that very large oval, about three quarters the size of the building across. This poor person was escorted out of her window. I don't know if she was willing or not. I don't think so, because it seemed as though she was being escorted up into this thing by three ugly but smaller human-like Kree. After she was escorted up and in, the oval turned reddish-orange again and whisked away, coming in our direction. It then plunged into the river behind us, not far from Pier 17, behind the Brooklyn Bridge. Someone else had to see what happened that morning. I know what we saw, and will never forget it. Mr. Hopkins, the oval never came up from under the river. We know the building, and we know which window she came out of. Perhaps she was just a figment of our imagination. If she isn't, is she alive and well? We have to know. We're feeling much better now that we've had the chance to tell someone else other than ourselves. We wish to stay anonymous for the time being on account of our profession. If we should decide to seek this person out, and she may very well value her privacy as we do, and we respect that. We'll contact you again with further information if we do find her, and I hope we do. Many thanks. Hey. After reading the letter, he was able to identify the woman that Richard and Dan were referring to, that woman being Linda Napolitano. Approximately about two weeks from Bud receiving the letter, he received a frantic call from Linda. She had stated that she had a very weird and awkward encounter with two self-claimed police officers. It was almost midnight when she heard a knock at the door. Linda stated that the two men were dressed in men in black, things like clothing, and showed her their badges. She was nervous during her 30-minute conversation. Richard almost started crying to Linda. Linda retold her experience in regards to her, her husband, and children. She states that they were put into such a deep sleep that she couldn't wake them up for several hours. She would eventually put a mirror under her son's nose to ensure he was alive. Why? To see if he had fogged the mirror. Linda told Richard and Dan that they should visit Bud in person, but the two were hesitant on doing that at this time. However, later the two would send a tape to Bud in regards of what they witnessed. The tape would begin mid-sentence. Here is an actual rare audio recording of Richard and Dan that I could find. My father was very disoriented and embarrassed. This is what he said to me. The 23 other witnesses who claim to have seen the UFO hovering above the bridge on that night. I'm standing at exactly the spot where this very strange event was seen on at 3 a.m. really on November 30th, 1989. A woman is driving from Brooklyn to New York, right down here in the outer lane. The car engine died, the lights went out, and she looked over to this building, the one in the distance with a little pointed roof and at that point she saw a burst of light as a UFO hovering only a few feet above it turned on all of its lights two small figures below her and one above her several years later Bud Hopkins met with Queller at Chicago's O'Hare Airport and the two briefly talk about the abduction of Linda Javier Perez de Queller stated that he indeed witnessed the abduction but would not come forward many sources of Bud Hopkins and published media believe that the UN was working with aliens to end the Cold War. The abduction wasn't just witnessed by Queller's bodyguards and other citizens. In fact, Janet Kimball, 
A retired phone operator traveling home from a late night party also witnessed it. Janet Kimball was on her way back home from a late night retirement party. According to Bud Hopkins, the two communicated through letters, phone, and even met in person. She told him her car had stopped and along with other drivers. The surrounding neighborhood experiences a major power outage. The scene she describes was quite chaotic, with people honking horns and shouting in dismay. She watched what she first thought was a movie being filmed, though she quickly realized that it couldn't be. Cortile's apartment is very near the bridge, but the other three witnesses send the case reeling into pretty wild territory. Two of them wrote to Hopkins, introducing themselves as New York policemen who'd seen the abduction from a car parked under the FDR drive. Some workers of the New York Post even claimed that they had witnessed the event. At the nearby New York Post, one of whom was an investigative reporter named Stephen Dunleavy, another witness by the name of Yant Spence, a delivery driver for the Post, also recalls witnessing Linda's abduction on the Brooklyn Bridge. He claims to have first thought they were filming a movie. They were witnesses from the New York Post newspaper. Unfortunately, Dan was eventually committed to a mental facility due to their over, the top attempt to get answers from Linda. It's believed that this incident left Richard and Dan terrified of what they saw and scared that they might be abducted in a similar manner in the future, as Richard and Dan had security detail at the United Nations but none of them ever truly revealed what transpired on that fateful night. The founder and director of Mutual UFO Network, Walter H. Andrus strongly believed in the Politano story and called it a definitely authentic case of human abductions by aliens. Andrus said he knows what the aliens are after. They have been using humans to further their species. Ralph Blumenthal is an award-winning reporter for the New York Times. He is the author of several books such as The Believer based upon the abduction accounts from the late Harvard of Psychiatry, Dr. John Mack. Here is an interview from the YouTube channel Concrete where Ralph recaps Linda's abduction. There's actually a book by, by Bud Hopkins called Witnessed, and uh, this is a story. Two security guards, they call themselves police officers, but let's say two security guards were escorting a VIP to Manhattan. Uh, in November, security guards got out and they saw a spacecraft approaching an 11-story building near the Brooklyn Bridge. They saw a woman, a figure of a woman, fly out of the window, surrounded by three alien creatures, all flying in the sky. He escorted her into the spaceship, and it flew off and plunged into the East River. The woman later came forward uh, herself and, con and con contacted Bud Hopkins, which is really how, how the story started. And um, and Bud Hopkins found some witnesses who said they, they, they were stuck on the Brooklyn Bridge where all traffic came to a stop, uh, the power went out, uh, they saw this woman you know, flying out of the window into the spacecraft. The thing is, the story was, was uh, told to Bud Hopkins by the woman who said she was the, the target of the abduction. And it was also told by, by these two security guards who said they witnessed it, who were driving down in Lower Manhattan. Criticized by UFO skeptic Philip Class. UFOs will persist as long as there are people on this earth. A former senior editor for Aviation Week of Space Technology magazine, he is known as the Sherlock Holmes of ufology. UFO skepticism. Class devoted several issues of his UFO skeptics newsletter to the Quartile case, uncovering implausibilities and major discrepancies in her story and its handling by Hopkins. For example, Cortile later added to her story that her son had been abducted by aliens two months earlier and that the craft that took her crashed into the East River. No such incident was reported by any witness. Class said the two alleged security agents, Dan and Richard, have never been found, although Hopkins allegedly arranged for them to meet Cortile in her apartment. She later claimed that Dan kidnapped her from Manhattan Street and took her to a safe house. And Class said Hopkins claimed to have received a letter from the third man who witnessed the incident, the world leader who refused to step forward. Despite mounting evidence against Cortile's story, even some MUFON members were skeptical. Andrus called it a case of the century. However, there is much skepticism about Napolitano. Some people compared it with the sci-fiction novel Night Eyes, originally published on March 1, 1989. But at the same time, there are 23 eyewitnesses who saw this strangeness that night. In his 1988 book, UFO Abductions, A Dangerous Game, 
Class described the emergence of what he calls an alien abduction cult among UFO enthusiasts. The book examines numerous claims of alien stories abducting young children and taking flesh samples. Bud Hopkins' Alien Story Letters and drawings from people describing their own strange encounters with creatures like these. These are very small, frail-looking figures. And all of the power or energy or force or whatever they seem to have uh, really resides in the eyes. Ufologist author Bud Hopkins wrote a book on Linda's experience titled Witnessed the Brooklyn Bridge UFO Abduction. The book is over 400 pages of interviews, transcripts from hypnosis sessions, and even pictures. This has been called the most important UFO case of the 20th century. This book chronicled Linda's abduction and detailed the more unusual elements of her experience. Consider what Hopkins asks us to accept. To begin with, he tells us that, for the first time ever, a UFO abduction has been witnessed. Linda Cortiel, a housewife who lives on the Lower East Side of Manhattan with her husband and two sons, Cortile isn't her real last name. But the other three witnesses send the case reeling into pretty wild territory. Two of them wrote to Hopkins, introducing themselves as New York policemen who'd seen the abduction from a car parked under the FDR Drive, a highway that runs along the east side of Manhattan, facing Cortile's building. That wasn't the whole story, though. Later, they revealed that they were security officers working for an unnamed American agency and guarding a man Hopkins describes simply as an international political figure. But who was widely known to be Javier Perez de Cuellar, at that time Secretary General of the United Nations? D. Quellar supposedly saw the abduction too, and with that one stroke, the case seems to get even more unbelievable. Though we might ask ourselves why D. Quellar should be any less likely to witness an abduction than any ordinary person. To make matters worse, D. Quellar allegedly wasn't the only top official there. Allegedly, he and his guards were part of a group coming late at night from the heliport on Governor's Island. According to a recent podcast, Ryan Sprague's Somewhere in the Skies Ryan speaks to the former assistant of the late Bud Hopkins, Peter Robbins. Peter retells his inside of the case. And downtown at the time with two security people was a very important diplomat. Once Bud had established who it was, it seemed so outrageous that the book does not mention who it was. It became an open secret and now is pretty much public knowledge that it was Perez de Cuellar who at the time was the Secretary General of the United Nations. So one reason the case is considered controversial is, yeah, right. Please give me a break. The Secretary General of the United Nations was downtown at two in the morning. Why? Well, he may have had a romantic liaison. He's a married man. He was in a very important diplomatic, internationally diplomatic position. And now things get really strange. The two security officers known only as Richard and Dan. Hopkins says he never met them doesn't know their last names, and knows their story only through letters and audio tapes they sent, became obsessed with Cortile. They spied on her, showed up at her apartment, and even kidnapped her, spurred by a confused mixture of feelings. Fear for her safety, fear that she herself might be an alien, a sense of professional failure. Shouldn't they have tried to stop the abduction? And fight to be near Cortile, simply to prove that what they'd seen had been real. Dan, who began to lose his emotional moorings, then kidnapped Cortiel a second time. And earlier, however, he told Hopkins that he, Richard, and DeCuler now remembered that they'd all been abducted along with Cortiel. The aliens, Dan wrote, had telepathically identified her as Lady of the Sands. She'd held up a dead fish and told the three men, look and see what you've done. In yet another unpublished tidbit, Richard later said that Dan returned from the abduction clutching the dead fish and would have held on to it if he hadn't been persuaded to drop it from the car's window. Cortillo hadn't consciously remembered that, but under hypnosis, she did recall the same details and can be seen on video after her hypnosis. Reacting with shock as Dan's letter is read to her. One curious sidelight here, and yet another amazement in this case, is that Richard, Dan, and Dayueller remembered everything without hypnosis. 
Richard, in fact, recalled a lifetime of abductions and set off another bombshell when he told Hopkins that he and Cortell had been abducted together many times, beginning in their childhood. They had formed a secret, shadowy relationship, one that existed only on the alien ships and had become lovers. Richard, who had never married, was convinced he was the real father of her youngest child. Cortillo, duly hypnotized, remembered all this too, right down to the pet names Richard said they called each other when they were with the aliens. Again, her shocked reaction was caught on video, though she won't comment on her son's paternity. Anyone who needs a pause right here, to pour a drink perhaps, or just to hyperventilate or scoff, should take one. Why? Responsible UFO researchers might ask, did things have to get this messy? Why did DQLer have to be involved? And must we have this tabloid love affair? It isn't reassuring to learn that Richard, during his abduction with Cortile, Deanne, and Dick Willar, saw the aliens processing samples of earthly sand and brought some back with him. That's another first. The first time any abductee came back with anything from an alien ship, the aliens should abduct trained security operatives more often. Richard even was alert enough, he said, to snatch before and after. Samples, which, when examined with an electron microscope, allegedly show subtle differences. We're also asked to believe that yet another abductee called Marilyn Kilmer in the book was separately abducted with Cortile de Quillar and Cortilier's younger son, Johnny. Emotionally. One of his most remarkable cases is that of John Cortilia, an 11-year-old boy from New York's Lower East Side. When it happened, I had woke up from my sleep and I had the sudden urge to look out the window in my living room. So I got out of my bed and I just, you know, went into my uh, living room. I looked out the window and I saw something emerging from the water. So I didn't know what it was. I just watched it as it came toward my window. And as my mother passed me, I was screaming and she didn't even hear me. So this thing just pulled me through the window John claims that these aliens took him aboard a UFO. They just took me into the door, and I was just laid down onto my stomach looking out these uh, windows. I do remember um, some sort of a scraping with a sort of long, rounded object, sort of like a knife scraping me or scratching me with it, trying to, like, hurt me or something. I woke up the next morning like it was a dream, only though I knew it wasn't a dream. Allegedly, Kilmer identified De Quiller from photographs, though not with complete certainty. She and Cortiel described what they saw each other wearing, and here again there's a video documenting their amazement as each correctly names what the other swears she to bed that night. But even now we're not quite finished. In what might be the strangest episode of all, De Quiller had his driver stop his car while Johnny passed them on the street. Johnny then was nine and asked Johnny if he'd like a present. When Johnny said yes, against his better judgment, DQ Eller arranged to deliver the gift, which turned out to be an antique diver's helmet. I've seen the helmet. It sits in ornate bronze splendor on a wall unit in the Cortile's tiny living room, unabashedly out of place among the photos and other items you'd expect a lower middle class family to display. How do we know it came from DQ Eller? Because Hopkins showed Johnny photographs of distinguished older men, and Johnny picked DQ Eller's without a moment's hesitation. According to the late Bud Hopkins' wife, Carol Rainey, Linda has made crazy claims, such as being abducted by aliens along with John the Gotti Gambino family boss. You like pop music? Well, Linda claims she was a professional singer in a well-known pop band. Claims to have met the Pope. Claims to have been in the Twin Towers on the September 11th attacks. And furthermore, claims to have been Fran Drescher from the television's show The Nanny's Doppelganger. That last part is a joke. Oddly, Fran Drescher also claims to have been abducted by aliens along with her husband, so there may be some sort of connection. Sadly, this incident is still shrouded in mystery, but by combining witness testimonies, letters, tape recordings from Richard and Dan, it's possible to piece together a greater understanding of what happened to Linda that night. Even today, over 30 years later, Linda lives in New York City, which still hasn't forgotten her traumatic experience that November evening. According to Linda, if I was hallucinating, then the witnesses saw my hallucination. 
That sounds crazier than the whole abduction phenomenon. So, the question today is where's Linda? Linda is active on social media. She does have a Facebook profile. I did attempt to reach out to her in regards to any comments about the case, but unfortunately, I did not receive a response. Well, what do you think? Is the whole Linda case a big lie for fame fortune? Let me know in the comments. closed and there was no response from my husband and that's when I did open my eyes and I looked straight ahead and there was this thing this creature standing at the foot of my bed and it was the first time I had ever seen that consciously I was awake I hadn't gone to sleep yet I was saying my prayers uh, and um, so by this time my legs were numb and uh, I sat up in bed, dragging my heavy legs with me, and turned up behind me and threw a pillow, a big pillow, uh, that I made. You would think that I stuffed them with rock, it was heavy. And I hit him too, that creature. And uh, my next conscious memory, uh, fragmented memory, was um, seeing white fabric flow up and over my eyes and then down again. And then I felt something, perhaps little fists or maybe an instrument, pounding on my back. And, uh, and that was all I remembered. And then my next conscious memory was that of falling into my bed. I could have fallen anywhere from two inches up or two feet up or whatever, but I was conscious and I felt myself falling to bed. <laughs> 